Good morning, Sofa Squad. How's it going? It's me, Paul, for the reporting live from my sofa. Today, we are going to be reviewing day two and the Dr. Teresa Seavers trial. Now, before we get started, I just always like to say, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge, I'm just here to do these videos to discuss my opinions of what I see in the case, what sticks out to me when I watch the testimony, and then to see what you all think and down in the comment sections. So, that being said, feel free to drop your comments down there, I love reading them and I do appreciate it. Also, don't forget we have a new Facebook group now, the link's going to be down in the description. We have our Discord, we have the other YouTube channels. Lots of social media and all sorts of fun stuff, so it's down there in the description. Don't forget to check it out. And without further ado, let's review. So now the first thing that took place on this day was some housekeeping, I like to call it. And the biggest piece of information from this housekeeping that I thought was like, oh wow, okay, was the state saying that they're really ahead of schedule. They were really pleased with how fast they've been moving. Now, of course, it was really difficult for them to give an exact time when they thought that they would be done, but it sounds like another week and a half or so. Now, remember this case, they set out like several weeks for it. And when this one against Rogers is over, then the next one's going to start against Seavers. So it's it's going to kind of be one of those long events. So the state also, they're not mind readers. They don't know what the defense is going to do. So a lot depends on that. But at least we know that the state is moving along at, at a nice pace. Now, the first witness of the day is going to be Detective Nolan. Detective Nolan was a lead investigator in Teresa's case uh, from the very beginning, and he was on there for about three months. Now, at some point, it is the question is asked, well, why were you taken off? And it's objected and sustained. To me, it sounded like he was getting ready to say he was just moved to another unit, but he didn't get to answer that, so that's just my little two cents. I could be completely wrong on that. He does recall Dr. Petritus being there on the scene at the crime when he arrived. And he said that, you know, he took swabs, did the DNA type stuff, all of those things, not because he was a suspect, but just to rule out any of, you know, his trace evidence that might be in the house. And he said that the doctor was very compliant with all of this. Now, likewise, he goes into some evidence about obtaining the same type stuff from Mark Seavers. Even though they know he lives there, they just want to get rid of anything that might muddy the pool, if you will, when they go through and start trying to gather trace evidence evidence, DNA, things of this nature. Now, he also states that they did take Mr. Seaver's phone to get a download from it for information. They said that he willingly signed the consent forms for that and that he was, you know, totally cool with that. Now, throughout this, there's objections, there's sidebars, there's things like this. A letter at one point causes this total uproar. They have to have a little a meeting over that. It, it's almost worth naming this trial the Dr. Seaver's case against the sidebar because it's just just, it's very prevalent. I get it. that They're dotting their I's and crossing their T's. So we're appreciative of that. But watching it makes it slow down a little bit. Now, when the defense gets up there, they want to talk about some of the blood staining, specifically the cast off. Now, Detective Nolan does say that that's not his specialty, but obviously he, he works in this line. So he's able to speak to it a little bit, but not as like an expert would. And he does say that there was no blood on the walls. There was no blood on the ceiling, that the blood was all like low to the ground. So when the state gets back up there to recross them, they pretty much just want to make this like, okay, let's make sure this is clear. And they confirm that what Nolan saw didn't lead him to think that she was killed anywhere else but there. And that even though there was no cast off here or there, the blood pooling and splatter that he did see was consistent with the injury, injuries that she displayed there in her kitchen. So the next witness on the stand is Kevin Stout, and he too works at the sheriff's office. He is a digital forensic supervisor. Now, Stout gets up there and explains what exactly they do, which is dealing with digital media and gathering evidence from it. Uh, they use a program that's called Cellbrite to get the data, and they spend a lot of time discussing exactly how they get that information from cell phones, what they do with it, so on and so forth. Now, eventually, this prompts another major objection, and this comes down to the text message extraction report. And this is major, major. This is get the jury out. Let's do sidebars. Let's do this. So eventually the judge says, you know what? Yeah, we're going to allow that testimony in because it seems that it is lining up the first contact for setting up the said conspiracy. Now the defense gets up to cross the witness and basically they determine that, you know, it is possible that Selbright could miss data that's been deleted from the phone. 
They're just trying to put into question Cellbrite and its reliability. Now, another witness that gets up after that is Jonathan Armato, a, shar a sheriff sergeant. And basically, he's just up there to talk about how he gathered biological samples from those living in the Seaver household. And again, this is just to eliminate DNA that was being recovered. He was up there very shortly, and then they moved on to their next witness who was Gladys Martinez. Now she was a latent examiner in the forensics division and she was a crime, that's what she is now, but she was a crime scene tech during this crime when it took place. Now she attended the autopsy of Dr. Seavers and this was to collect and preserve evidence. And the state, you know, has her review some of this evidence, uh, the, the dress that Seavers was wearing, so on and so forth, things from the autopsy. Uh, she talks about how they used alternative lighting to examine Ms. Seavers, uh, talks about blood samples they took, talks about hair samples they took, and they just really go into some detail about, you know, what was the autopsy about? How do you preserve that evidence? What evidence did you take? So on and so forth. Now, the next witness is Lieutenant Downs. And in 2015, he was a detective in the Major Crimes Unit. And he's going to spend the majority of the day up there. Now, the first part of the testimony that comes out is just what it was like when he arrived on the crime scene. He talks about things that we've seen already, like the, the pry marks in the door. You know, the house didn't look ransacked. There was money, you know, in the jar, upwards to 40000 thousand dollars that they found in the safe uh you know talks about doing a neighborhood canvas talks about items that recovered from the garbage at miss Seaver's practice and in general just kind of paints a picture as to what exactly took place there at the crime scene now as they get into the testimony more they get into the aspect of the lead that came out that basically sent them to missouri to execute a search warrant at curtis wright's and they talk about the vehicle that was searched, the GPS unit that was taken during that search. Now, during this investigation, more information that came out took him to Jimmy Rogers and Taylor Shoemaker. Now, he says that when they went there at first, it was just to get background on Curtis because essentially they had established that he was friends with them. You know, and they said that they didn't suspect Rogers of anything at that point. Now, he says that Rogers wasn't able to tell the detective where Wright was in the weekend of the event. And he says that Rogers also said that he hadn't been to Florida and that he was in town that weekend. So the investigation continues and the testimony continues. And he says that on their second trip back to Missouri, they actually obtained a search warrant for Rogers at this point. Now, what had taken place during this time is that they had gone through more evidence, done all this. And this is when the GPS Garmin had locked into Roger's cell phone. So essentially this technology is placing Rogers somewhere where he said that he was not. Now they see several things from Roger's house during the search warrant. Obviously they're looking for bloody items, things that might be related to the crime. Also during this time is when they have a conversation with Taylor Shoemaker and they take her with her to go look for a blue jumper and a phone that's on the side of the road as she claims. Now at this point the state has the witness, Mr. Downs, open up an evidence box that has this blue jumper in it and you know what honestly to me it was like very michael myers uh you know from the original halloween or whatever that's just kind of what it looked like now it looked like there were some pieces of it because remember in the discussions they said that once they did find the jumper on the side of the road it was kind of torn up or whatever it was more in one piece than i anticipated but there was some shreds to it and things of this nature. It probably, like the detective said, a lawnmower had run over it or something at this point. Now, next after this, they review pictures. Lots and lots of pictures. Some of the pictures that they go over are Curtis Wright's residence interiors, the Rogers interiors, uh, pictures of the vehicle that they took, things of this nature. They also show Roger's former work doe run. And they have pictures of like the locker room, pictures of like mounds of these blue uniforms like they had, and just things like that to paint a picture of, you know, how many uniforms there were. Now they also show a picture of a text message that is an exchange between Jim Conway, which is Roger's boss at Doe Run. In this text message, we see that Rogers is stating to Jim Conway that he's in Florida. So again, remember, Rogers had already said, oh, I wasn't in Florida. And so we're seeing all this evidence through technology saying, mm, no, I'm sorry, you were. So now about Taylor, the girlfriend. So Down denies promising Taylor anything or threatening to take her kids away or anything like this. Uh, he says that Taylor contacted him about witness protection and that she was specifically concerned about where she lived. Now this caused them to kind of do a little investigation to say, you know, okay, well, let's see if you're eligible for witness protection. And it turns out that she was, it was for like $400 a month, I believe. 
uh, and they also paid money towards her first and last for her apartment. I feel like he said it was like fifteen hundred or a thousand fifty, something like that for the first and last. So that's where the payment for the money is coming from. Now, if you remember in the previous video, I talked about this and I said, you know, okay, is this for witness protection or is this like a oh no, you're giving us info, here's some reward money because it's a majorly different thing. Now again, you know, I'm not her. I don't know. I would be feeling in danger too I get that so you know it, it makes me feel like she wasn't just straight up you know getting on the payroll for this information like there's a little bit more of a logical reason behind this now when the defense is up there they established that nothing bloody was found in Roger's home uh, and they also established that the jumpsuit found on the side of the road didn't have blood evidence on it because at one point it was referred to as like a bloody jumpsuit and there was no blood evidence uh, now, the defense also reestablishes that Roger, he was telling people he was going to Florida, just like the text messages showed. He made no efforts to really conceal his trip to Florida, and he brought his own phone with him, which, you know, he wasn't doing a burner phone, so you couldn't track him or whatever. And in reference to all those jumpsuits that we saw pictures of at his workplace, he says, look, so many people had access to these suits. Those could have been anybody's. Now, the next witness to get up there is a Miss Rose, and she's another crime scene tag. The biggest part of her testimony was her talking about helping organize a, a line search of cadets from the police academy. And essentially what a line search is, it's when you see these on TV and stuff. It's where literally body to body to body, you form a line and you move, you look, you examine. If you find evidence, you go over it, but you're combing the ground in whatever area. So she goes into the whole thing about how that works, all the areas they did, so on and so forth. Then the next part of her testimony relies into the transportation of one of the, the, ve the, the vehicle, the rental car, and how they did that, how they secured it, where they kept it, da, 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 da. Uh, a lot of the chain of custody, things of this nature, because remember, they want to make sure that nobody can say, oh, well, you know, they didn't want to see the car for five days, so that kind of stuff. Now, the next and last witness is Captain John Long. He is with the sheriff office. He takes the stand, and literally his main point to being up there is to talk about the license plate reader search. Now, the license plate reader search, I had to actually go look up the actual definition, so I'm just going to kind of read it to you here. Uh, it's an automated license plate reader. They are high-speed, computer-controlled camera systems that are typically mounted on street poles, street lights, and highway overpasses, mobile trailers, or attached to police squad cars. ALRs automatically capture all license plates that come into view, along with the location, date, and time. The data, which includes photographs of the vehicle, and sometimes its driver and passengers, is then uploaded to a central server. Now, basically, he said, you know, I didn't find any matches. So, you know, that was it. It was short-lived, and they moved on. And that was the wrap for the day. They kind of finished a little bit early. So that part was very nice for everybody involved. Uh, again, like I told you before, there's a lot of sidebars. There's a lot of objections, and they're timely objections. So, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, this trial's dry. It is a little bit dry, I'm not going to lie. But, again, you know, it's somebody's life. It's someone's justice that's on the line. Now, that's going to be all for today's recap and review. Again, I appreciate the Sofa Squad coming to hang out and listen to me. Uh, don't forget to drop a comment down there if you want to talk about the trial. Uh, if you want to support the channel in any way, the best way is to leave comments, like the video, share the video, all that fun stuff. I greatly appreciate it. It helps me out. Also, remember, we have the Facebook page. We're going to be doing watch parties from there. Don't forget to look at the other YouTube channels, social media, podcast channels, all that fun stuff. It's all down there in the description. So once again, thank you so much for everyone for being here, and I will talk to you later, alligators.